what happens when you die? Now, maybe you're here this morning and you're younger and you haven't really thought much about that. You can't, you can't envision that. You don't need to. You think you've got your whole life ahead of you. I can assure you some of us who are a little longer in the tooth probably think a little bit more about it as we see the day drawing near. What happens when you die? If you've ever typed that question into your search bar, then you're in the company of an army of people who are wondering the same thing. Who wouldn't be curious about something that has implications for every one of us, every person alive, every person who's ever lived? Very, very few are going to walk through this life without giving some thought eventually to its end. And though we don't always want to talk about it, we are well aware of our finiteness. The specter of death haunts many. In his preaching the word commentary on the book of Hebrews, author R. Kent Hughes has written, the fact of death, and for most the fear of death, is a relentless reality. The more our minds struggle to escape it, the more it comes against us. The more we fear it, the more dreadful it becomes. Those who try to forget it have their memories filled with it. Those who tr try to shun it meet nothing else. Samuel Taylor Coleridge gave this fear-chilling expression in the rhyme of the ancient mariner through the image of a man being stalked on an empty road. Like one that on a lonesome road doth walk in fear and dread, and having once turned round walks on and turns no more his head because he knows a frightful fiend doth close behind him tread. The truth is, every moment of our earthly life, death is gaining steps on us. Will we ignore it? Try to pick up our pace and outrun it? Collapse in terror? Or will we turn and stare it down? Our Father, we gather this morning to hear your voice, to let your truth sweep over our hearts and fill our minds. We ask that you will in these moments ahead by your spirit speak to us. Let us hear you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. For the past five weeks in our worship, we have been taking a pretty close look at the cross on which Jesus died. If one were to walk by this very same cross on the first Easter morning, one thing would be abundantly clear. It is empty. It is a barren cross. It is empty because it has fulfilled its purpose. The cross of crucifixion was an instrument of torture and death. No one hanging on a cross ever came down alive. The trained executioners never would allow a person to be taken off a cross unless that person was not dead. Jesus died on the cross. Now sometimes the Romans might have left a body suspended on a cross. They would do this sometimes for days. They like to use crucifixion as a deterrent, as a, as a way to terrorize their subjects, as a sign to those who might dare to defy Roman authority. They had no problem leaving corpses on crosses, having them decompose in the sun, becoming food for birds of prey, scavengers. But it was the Jewish leaders who wanted Jesus' body taken down. He died on the day of preparation. They didn't want his body hanging up there through the Sabbath. So a man named Joseph of Arimathea, who was well off and had a garden tomb, asked Pontius Pilate for permission to take the body of Jesus. Now Joseph of Arimathea seems to pop up here out of the blue, but we find with a little flipping through scripture, in fact, that he was a respected member of a group known as the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council. He was also one who believed in Jesus, but the Bible tells us he did this secretly for fear of the Jews. Well, now his secret is out. He is aligning himself with Jesus. He will take the body of our Lord and put it in his new private tomb. He and another secret disciple whose name you might recognize, Nicodemus. They might have come late publicly to the side of Jesus, but they did come. And I want that perhaps to inspire you today. 
let that inspire those of you who may not have come to the Lord yet and who now are thinking, well, there's really no sense in this. There's no gain in believing any of this stuff. I've lived without it my whole life. There's no sense for me to come along now. I've kind of wasted my life on myself and done my own thing. I can't imagine that God would want anything to do with me. I want to challenge that a little bit if you're asking why should I bother to come to Christ now? And I want to say that the thief on the cross beside Jesus will meet you in paradise and will explain it all to you. That it is not about what you've done as much as it is about what Jesus has done. It's not even about what you have time left to do. It's about what Jesus has done. And what Jesus wants to do is to forgive you and to receive you and to say to you the way that he said to that thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise. Salvation is by grace. So even if you feel it is late in your life to come to the Lord, the old adage couldn't be more true, better late than never. Come now, don't put it off. Don't wait. Joseph and Nicodemus had not been public to this point with their belief in Jesus for fear of what it might cost them. The Bible is clear about that, for fear of the Jews. But now they are still at risk for repercussions, perhaps in some ways even more so because they may be part of a group that's keeping this Jesus thing alive. They are willing to be faithful. They are willing to take that chance. They are willing to associate finally with Christ. Will you? It was getting on in the day. The body of the Lord was quickly wrapped up in a sheet of sorts and it was laid to rest in this tomb hewn out of a rock. A large stone was rolled in place to seal it. Christ had died and now he is buried. After the Sabbath, Jesus' body would be properly anointed for burial. So the cross is empty. The cross is empty because it has served its purpose. But we must understand it has not just served the purpose of the intentions of Christ's jealous false accusers or these spineless uh, politicians who are complicit in his death. They were just the ones that God used to fulfill his plan that had been laid from eternity past. See, a greater purpose was at work in the death of Jesus. As Peter would proclaim at Pentecost, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You see, it was the definite plan of God that his son would die. Nearsighted humans in that day thought they were just getting rid of a nuisance, of a competitor, of a challenge to their authority. In fact, God was intending to rid all who would believe from the power of consequences and consequences of sin. The cross on Sunday is empty because it has served God's purpose. Jesus has been crucified to pay for the sins of the world, to pay for your sins, to pay for my sins. The cross is not the only thing empty on that day. Early Sunday morning when the Sabbath had passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, had brought spices so they could go to the tomb of Jesus and anoint the body that had been so hastily removed from the cross and laid to rest. I want you to think for a moment about what these ladies are doing. This indeed is a labor of love, if ever there was one. This is a job that many would look for a reason to avoid, to go and make ready for final resting the body of their friend Jesus. On their way to the tomb, they, they remember there's a large rock that has sealed him in. And they're not sure how they're going to get in there to do this work. We find in Mark's account that those concerns are short-lived and, and unfounded because when they get there, they see that the tomb is already open. And entering it, they found a young man an angel of the Lord dressed in a white robe. And Mark says they were alarmed. And this is one of these places where the, the English language really doesn't give full import to the original. That sometimes the Bible has these little, they're understatements. I mean, can you imagine what it must have been like for them? 
to go, to think that they're going to anoint the body of Jesus, to find the tomb open, to walk in it, to find it empty safe, some guy sitting there in a white robe, some angelic being. And, and, and Mark says, they were alarmed. But let me tell you, that word means is somewhere between astounded and thrown into terror. That's what it means, literally. And that's what it was like for them. They are afraid about this. They are afraid, but the young man sitting there simply says to them, don't be. You don't need to be. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. In other words, you have the right address. You have come to the right tomb. I know who you're looking for. He's not here. And the reason that he's not here is because he's risen from the dead. This, by the way, in case you're not familiar with the story of Jesus, this, by the way, is exactly what he said was going to happen. And he told his disciples many times this was going to happen. The Son of Man will be delivered over. He will be crucified. He will be killed. And on the third day, he will, raise. Je he will rise. Jesus said this about himself, and this is exactly what has happened. And the angel confirms it. And he bids the ladies to look around. Take a look. See where he was. See where he was because it's not where he is. He's not dead. He's alive. This is as plain and direct an accounting of the resurrection of Jesus that one can find. Now, when I was a younger preacher, when I knew more than I know now, I would, I would at times take the opportunity on Easter to share and to challenge, it was, it was a bit of a challenge for me, the many theories and uh, uh, ideas that have been posited over the years intended to debunk the resurrection claims. So I would talk about those things in an Easter message. The swoon theory, the theory that Jesus hadn't really died on the cross, but he had just swooned, he had just passed out and then when they took him off the cross they put him in a cool tomb and in the cool tomb he he revived then there's the disciples stole his body theory and then there's the hysterical woman looking in the wrong place theory which i'm sure you women really appreciate because <laughs> we all know how women are you know hysterical and unable to identify people they know which flows into the gardener mistaken for Jesus theory that they didn't really see Jesus. They, they saw a gardener instead, and then they made this whole story that, again, these are silly, and it's a challenge even now for me not to dig deeper into them. But I was just say this. There's enough in Scripture, there's enough common practice to refute these as baseless ideas. In some ways, it would take more faith to believe these theories than to accept that Jesus really did rise from the dead. So for a time at Easter, I would succumb to the need to be creative or to be evocative. I would try to prove the resurrection. I would, I would at times be more of an apologist or a debater from the pulpit than a preacher. But John Stott helped me get over this. He wrote a little book called The Preacher's Portrait. He lays out the preacher's job, what it is a preacher is supposed to do, and what a preacher ought not be doing. And he writes this. He says that preachers are stewards of the mysteries of God. The metaphor of stewardship, he writes, reminds us that preachers do not supply their own message. They are supplied with it. Stewards were not expected to feed the household out of their own pocket in the same way preachers are not expected to rely on their own ingenuity when it comes to their message. We are to preach the word of God and nothing else. So what does the word of God say about Easter? The word of God says that Jesus rose from the dead. What does the preacher preach on Easter? By, oh my goodness, some of these people, you know, they're going to think this is the only thing I know how to talk about. I have to come up with something new. I have to come up with something different. I have to find a different name. No, what is a preacher supposed to preach about on Easter? Jesus rising from the dead. Now one either accepts that that is true, that it, because it is the word of God and because the Holy Spirit has done that convincing work already in a person's heart, 
or one rejects it and, and does so for a number of reasons. There are any number of reasons for people to reject it. In church, we believe it. As Christians, we believe it. On Easter and pretty much every Sunday, we proclaim it. The tomb in which the crucified Jesus was laid to rest on Friday was empty by Sunday morning because Jesus had risen from the dead. But what does that mean? How does it translate, does it? I want to finish up by considering a few of the implications of Christ's resurrection. First is this. Jesus is not only alive, he is alive forevermore. Alive forevermore. Consider how Jesus introduced himself to John in the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verses 17 to 18. He said, fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. Okay? But get this. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore. You may have a translation that says, I was dead. I was dead, but I'm not dead anymore. I am alive, in fact, forevermore. And I have the keys to hate and death. Jesus was not like his friend Lazarus. Remember that story? Jesus raised his friend Lazarus from the dead, but Lazarus was raised only to die again. The risen Christ will never die. He ascended into heaven after 40 days of post-resurrection appearances on earth. Jesus is alive forevermore. He is seated, the Bible tells us, at the right hand of the Father. What is he doing? He is interceding even now for his church, dear ones. He's going to bat for you. That's what he's doing in heaven. One day he's going to return, and he's going to gather us all to himself. Evil will suffer a final debilitating ultimate blow and it will be banished from all of our existence and God and man will live together in a new heaven and a new earth Jesus is not only alive he is alive forevermore he is a conquering king also because he lives others will live the resurrection of Jesus we read in 1 Corinthians 15 is the first fruits the first fruits of those who've fallen asleep, that is, those who have died. Jesus' resurrection is the pledge. Jesus' resurrection is the earnest. Jesus' resurrection is the promise of what awaits, that a trail has been blazed, that the resurrection of the faithful will come. That is why he could tell his disciples in John chapter 14, yet a little while and the world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live you also will live. In chapter 11, verses 25 and 26 of John's Gospel, Jesus is speaking and he says this, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? That's an important question. Do you believe this? That Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And that if you believe in him, even though you die, because Jesus is not saying that you won't die, this physical body won't go away. He's saying just that if you do, when you do, you're going to live. Do you believe it? And of course, a verse that we're all familiar with, probably John 3, 16. I give it to you this morning in the KJV, the way that I learned it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Because he lives, others will live. Eternal life is the gift of God to those who believe. I want to talk just a second about this idea of believing. Because sometimes in our culture especially, it seems that we get it wrong. The belief that the Bible talks about is more than an acknowledgement of an historical person named Jesus that he existed in time and space it is more even than trusting that Jesus is God because you hear this people say well yeah I believe I believe that Jesus yeah I believe Jesus and even say yes I believe that Jesus was God but it's more than even that James reminds us that the demons believe and shudder 
They know that Jesus is God, and it doesn't save them. So it's more than a mental assent that Christ existed. It's more even than a believing that he is God. It is believing that he accomplished what he said he came to do, which is to give his life a ransom for many, or to give his life for you, for me. It is receiving by faith what Christ did on the cross when he shed his blood so that your sins could be forgiven, when he paid your price on that cross of death. He did what he said he would do. So when the Bible talks about believing, that's what it's talking about. Believing in that, that Jesus died for me, that Jesus paid the penalty for me, that Jesus' perfect record, he never sinned, he was always obedient, he's way different than me, is attributed to me by faith that his atoning death satisfied the just wrath of God that God has against me. Jesus paid for my rebellion. He died for it. And his resurrection from the dead is the public proof that his father accepts his sacrifice. And so the scripture tells us that he has overcome the power of sin and death. Death and eternal separation from God no longer have the last word. There is life after death in the presence of God given to us because of Jesus. And this is why the Apostle Paul can write in 1 Corinthians 15, O death, where is your victory? By the way, if you're looking for a chapter of the Bible to read today on this Easter day, I, I commend to you 1 Corinthians 15. And I say read the whole thing. It is a beautiful chapter, a beautiful Easter chapter. In verses 55 to 57, Paul writes, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Did you hear that word? Victory. Victory through Jesus Christ. Today we're talking about an empty cross, an empty tomb, and this thing called victory seems an odd word to associate with those first two. Because on the Friday Jesus died, the cross would, was not looking like victory. In fact, it could not have looked more like defeat. A, a cross with the Son of God suffering and hanging on it could not have been more depressing, could not have been more disillusioning, could not have been more definitive. The hopes of all that were pinned on Jesus died when he died Pinned on a cross. Likewise, the tomb is such a symbol of finality. It signifies the end of life, a battle lost. How many times do you read in the obituaries over and over again about this lost battle? She lost her battle with. He lost a hard-fought battle with. We know that death in the grave signifies a loss. How many gravesides have I officiated at over the years with men and women holding on to a casket, unwilling to let it be lowered into the ground? There is such a finality there, such a parting. The tomb is a loss. The tomb and the cross both look like defeat, but that is not what was happening. That was not the plan, and that is not reality. Our Savior displayed on the criminal's cross. Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost. But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested and my life began. Newsflash, in an amazing turn of events, God snatches victory from the jaws of defeat. And not just a victory for Jesus. He knew this was going to happen. I'm sure he was quite pleased about it. Well, he should have been. But not just for him. He was killed and buried and brought back to life. us. 
to bring many sons to glory. It's not just about him. It is a shared victory. When we celebrate the empty tomb, we are celebrating a shared victory. It's for us. It's for you and me. He overcame sin and death, and you and I can overcome it as well. Because of Jesus, we know that death is not the end. We know that death does not have the final word. And if you know that and you believe that, friend, that's when you can begin to live. That's when you begin to live. When you get over this fear of death. When you understand what you're here for. You are made by God for God. Until you discover that, you won't know the pleasures that you are seeking. When you do know that, you have all the purpose in the world. You can live with purpose. You can live with peace. You can live without fear. Hebrews chapter 2, if you have a Bible, I'd ask you to turn there. Hebrews chapter 2, Lord willing, will be in the book of Hebrews later in this year. I'm not, I'm not going to exposit, exegete this passage. I just want to call your attention to a small portion of it, but I think we have to get a larger, ver larger portion in order to get the gist. So Hebrews 2, verse 9. Hebrews 2, 9. But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he for whom and by whom all things exist in bringing many sons to glory should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he's not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will sing your praise, and again I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. So it's just this last verse that I want to call your attention to this morning that speaks of the life, what the life, death, and resurrection of Christ accomplishes. Through it, he destroyed the one who has the power of death, which is the devil. Now look, in order to deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. What the Bible is teaching us here is that fear of death keeps a person in bondage. Fear of death and never getting over it amounts to lifelong slavery. So I ask you this morning, can you relate to this? Well, I understand. I understand some people are just going to be brave here. I don't, I don't worry about death. I never think about it. And if I did, I wouldn't tell you on a bat. I'll worry about that when I get there, people say. How much peace do you have when you get there? Can you relate to this? Do you honestly have a fear of death? The great theologian Woody Allen <laughs> has famously said, I'm not afraid to die. I just don't want to be there when it happens. <laughs> I'm not afraid to die. I'm just afraid to die. That's what he's saying. It's common concern. Nothing's wrong with you if you have that concern. But listen, it's a concern that the resurrection erases, takes away. By understanding the forgiveness of our sins that Jesus makes possible, there needs to be, and we sing this, we sing this when we sing the song in Christ alone, there needs to be no guilt in life and no fear in death. Okay? No guilt in life. You can come up with a long list of things that you've done wrong, transgressions, sins, your failures, re your regrets, your inadequacies. You can come up with that. Any one of us can come up with that long list. And yet in Christ, there's no need to live with guilt under that. Why? Because his blood cleanses you from those sins. 
You don't have to live in that guilt. Well, you don't understand, Pastor. I knew it was wrong and I did it anyway. Really, you think that makes you different? <laughs> he forgives all of our sins if we ask. So no need to live under guilt. And there's no need to live in the fear of death. Listen again to Hebrews, this time chapter 9, verses 27 and 28. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. And I'm going to just pause here just for a second and say, because I realize that today there's, there's some with us who, who don't really believe in the Bible, who don't think it's God's word. And I just want to winsomely challenge you this morning. This is what the Bible says, and it comes true all the time. It is appointed unto man to die once. We don't know anybody in our circle of friends that has escaped this sentence. It's coming to all of us. But the piece that you may want to think about, after that comes judgment. That is to say, that the Bible says God will judge you. How will you fare in the judgment? And whose record will you take to stand before the Lord? If you're not going to receive him or his word or the forgiveness that he offers, then you are choosing to stand before God on your own merit. And I don't think there's anybody who honestly in this room would say that's a good idea. That I have done so much that I deserve heaven. But if you receive Christ, when you stand before God, he looks on you and he sees the record of, your, of his son. And he sees perfection. And he says, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter in. Enter in. Hebrews tells us that it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Did you catch that? Jesus has already come to deal with sin, and he has dealt with sin definitively on the cross. That is why he gave his life. That is what he has done. In instead, when he comes again, he's going to come to save all those who are, who are eagerly waiting for him. And I want to challenge you this morning to be counted among those who are eagerly waiting for Jesus. Who are waiting for his return. Who are not looking at your watch and saying, can I have another hour down here? It's so blissful. <laughs> Think it through, folks. Think it through, friends. Waiting for Jesus to come and save. Jesus gave his life to bear our sins. The risen Christ is coming back to gather all those who believe to himself forevermore. When he comes, the graves will surrender the dead, and we will be made like him. The Christians at Thessalonica were, if you've read the book of 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, they were, they're just like us. They, they're trying to understand Jesus. They're trying to understand how this all fits. And they're pondering that question of what happens when you die. And specifically, they're wondering what happens to those who, have, who die before Jesus comes back. Because in that day, they didn't know, is Jesus coming right back? A lot of people thought he was. But in the meantime, some people had passed away. And they were believers and they were disciples. But how is Jesus going to save them? So Paul writes to them these words I want to share with you in closing. Hear what the word of God teaches to those who are wondering about what happens when Jesus returns. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Now, I've read that I don't know how many times. I bet you have too. N number, many, many, many times, I bet. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Okay, stop for a second. What is that going to look like? What is it going to look like? I tell you a little bit about what it's going to look like. The cemeteries giving up their dead. The seas giving up our dead. The battlefields giving up their dead. God graciously raising bodies that have become dust and scattered and reforming them 
and taking that which was perishable and making it imperishable. That's what it looks like when the dead in Christ will rise first. But after that, we who are alive, we who remain, should anybody be alive when Jesus comes back and believe in him? Listen to what Paul says. We'll be caught up together with them. All of us going up to Jesus in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And here's the thing. And so we will always be with the Lord. Like no more separation. No more being apart from that which we love, those whom we love, and the one we love most, our God. We will always, always, always be from that point on with him. And so the Bible says, therefore, let us encourage one another with these words. And aren't those words of encouragement, friend? These are words of encouragement. They are intended to be. Death doesn't have the final say. And these words are supposed to be a source of comfort. They're given to us to bring us some comfort in the face of death. And they are words of comfort, but they are only words of comfort if one has first come to Christ for the forgiveness of sins. The assurance of eternal life is for those who trust that Jesus has paid and paved the way. If you know this for yourself today, Christian, then rejoice. Rejoice in your good God who gave his son to save you. If you do not know this today, if you do not know the forgiveness of your sins through Christ, would you come now to him and receive the gift of everlasting life that he offers you today. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen. He is risen.